I am here, ostensibly, to introduce to you the lecturer of the occasion, the Reverend Dr. Van Dyke of Princeton University. Not to tell you who he is, you know that already. Not to praise his delicious books, they praise themselves better than any words of mine could do it for them. Then is there any real use or advantage in my being here at all? Yes. I am here to talk and put in the time while Dr. Van Dyke reflects upon what he is going to say, and whether he had better say it or not. Chance has furnished me a text, a text which offers me an opportunity to teach, an opportunity to be instructive. And if I have a passion for anything, it is for teaching. It is noble to teach oneself. It is still nobler to teach others. And less trouble. My text is a telegram from the Daily Review, an Illinois newspaper which says, In what book of yours will we find a definition of a gentleman? This question has been asked me a number of times by mail in the past month or two, and I have not replied. But if it is now going to be taken up by telegraph, it is time for me to say something. And I think that this is the right time and place for it. The source of these inquiries was an Associated Press telegram of a month or so ago which said in substance that a citizen of Joplin, Missouri, who had just died, had left $10,000 to be devoted to the dissemination among young men of Mark Twain's idea of the true gentleman. This was a puzzle to me, for I had never in my life uttered in print a definition of that word, a word which one had a, once had a concrete meaning, but has no clear and definite meaning now, either in America or elsewhere. In England, long ago, and in America in early times, the term was compact and definite and was restricted to a certain grade of birth, and it had nothing to do with character. A gentleman could commit all the crimes and bestialities known to the Newgate calendar and be shunned and despised by everybody, great and small. Yet he would still be unquestionably a gentleman just the same and no one could dispute it. But in our day, how would you define that loose and shackly and shadowy and colorless word, in case you had thirty-five years to do it in? None but a very self-complacent and elaborately incompetent person would ever try to define it. And then the result wouldn't be worth the violent mental strain it had cost. The weeks drifted along, and I remained puzzled. But at last, when this telegram came, I suddenly remembered. Remembered that I had once to find the word? Not at all. What I remembered was this. In the first fortnight of March, four years ago, a New York lady defined the word in a published interview. The main feature of her definition was that no man is a gentleman who hasn't had a college education. Oh, dear me. Adam, for instance. And Arkwright and Watt and Stevenson and Whitney and Franklin and Fulton and Morrison. Elias Howe and Edison and Graham Bell. And Lincoln. And Washington. And... And me. What a project to select and set apart a majestic and monumental class for the people's reverence and homage, then degrade it, belittle it, make it trivial, make it comical, make it grotesque, by leaving out of it the makers of history, the uplifters of man, the creators and preservers of civilization. 
the idea of leaving us out. It was my privilege to laugh if I did it privately. Very well, I did it privately. Considering the fact that the person who proposes to define that word must be equipped with almost limitless knowledge and daring and placid self-confidence, it seemed to me that the late Simon Hanks of Cape Cod had surely changed his sex and was come again. The poet says, The Lord knows all things great and small, with doubt, He's never vexed. Ah, yes, the good Lord knows it all. But Simon Hanks comes next. The matter seemed settled. But the New York papers have long known that no large question is ever really settled until I have been consulted. It is the way they feel about it, and they show it by always sending to me when they get uneasy. So the interviewers came up to Riverdale to get the verdict. I was in bed trying to amuse the bronchitis, therefore I got myself excused. I said not a word upon the subject to anyone. Yet there was a long and fictitious interview pretending to come from me in one of the papers the next morning the only instance in which a paper on either side of the Atlantic had treated me uncourteously and unfairly for many years. I was made to speak in the first person and to furnish my idea of what a gentleman is. You will perceive that there is a sort of grotesque and degraded humor about that situation. All definers of the modern gentleman are agreed that among his qualities must be honesty, courtesy, and truthfulness. Very well, here's a journalist who sends to me a forger to represent him, then prints the forger's product and filches money with it from his deceived readers. Yet, if I should assert that he is not a gentleman... His friends could quite properly require me to prove it, and I couldn't do it. For well, I don't know what a gentleman is. A gentleman on the indefinite modern plan. It's the fourth dimension to me with the unsquared circle and the nebula theory added. There is also another humorous detail or two about the situation. The forged interview deceived and beguiled that trusting and well-meaning citizen of Joplin before he died, and pillaged his heirs after he was in his grave. They can't get the bequested money, for it has to go to the dissemination of my definition of what a gentleman is. The proposed class and gentlemanliness can't get it for my definition doesn't exist and has never existed. The money is tied up for good and all. I believe it is the most dismally and pathetically and sardonically humorous incident I have ever come across. Now then, can't we define the American gentleman at all as a whole? No. We can define the best part of him, the valuable part. It is as far as we can get. The rest of him is hazy, diffused, uncertain. It is this, that, and the other thing. It is everything and nothing. According to Tom, Dick, and Harry's undigested notion, and when you've got the jumble all jumbled together to suit you, if it still seems to lack something, Whitewash it with a college education and call game. What shall we say is the best part, the accepted part, the essential part of the American gentleman? Let us say it is courtesy and a blemishless character. What is courtesy? Consideration for others. Is there a good deal of it in the American character? So far as I have observed, 
No. Is it an American characteristic? So far as I have observed, the most striking, the most prominent, the most American of all American characteristics is the poverty of it in the American character. Even the foreigner loses his kindly politeness as soon as we get him Americanized. When we have been abroad among either the naked savages or the clothed civilized for even so brief a time as a year, the first thing we notice when we get back home is the wanton and unprovoked discourtesies that assail us at every turn. They begin at the customs pier and they follow us everywhere. Such of you as have been abroad will feel with remembered pangs and cheek burnings that I am speaking the truth. The rest of you will confess it some day when you come home from abroad. You will step into the trolley with your heart so full of thankfulness to be at home again that you can't speak. You are so glad, so happy. So grateful that the tears blur everything and you say to yourself, Oh, am I really at home once more? Then the conductor bawls out, Come, step lively, will you? And you realize that you are. It is a shameful phrase which is preserved and perpetuated for him and for us by the president and directors of the company by their indifference and by their contempt for the public. They and they alone are responsible for it, not he. They could stop it forever with a single command. He utters their voice and their feeling. They are gentlemen on the modern plan. Yes, you are at home again, unquestionably. You realize that in no country on the planet, savage or civilized, but your own, could you hear your unoffending old father and mother and your gentle young sister assailed with that brutal insult? Also, that no people on the planet but ours is meek enough to stand it. We allow our commonest rights to be trampled underfoot every day and everywhere. Among us, citizenship is an unknown virtue. We have never claimed to be the meek nation, the timid nation. I don't know why, there being no competition. We have never claimed to be the uncourteous nation, the unpolite nation. I don't know why, there being no competition. Is it because we are also the too modest nation? Probably. Is that why we still keep that old, quiet, courtly, uninsolent, uncharacteristic E Pluribus Unum for our national motto instead of replacing it with an up-to-date one full of national character? Come, step lively! I am working hard day and night without salary or hope of applause upon my high and self-appointed task of reforming our national manners, and I ask for your help. Am I polite, do you ask? Well, no. I'm an American myself. Why don't I begin by reforming my own manners? I have already explained that in the beginning. I said it is noble to teach others, and less trouble. Having now finished this extraneous and unofficial lecture, I invite the real lecturer to approach and deliver to you his message. But I do it courteously. You will never hear me say to Reverend Dr. Van Dyke, whom I and the nation revere, Come, step lively.